Morning, everybody. Um, if you have a Bible, please turn to John's Gospel and chapter 17. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, I think you'll be able to follow on the screen or maybe look over someone's shoulder. So I'm going to read uh, the whole of John chapter 17. Good morning, by the way, again. Anyway, here we go. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed. This is quite an awesome chapter of the Bible, really. Um, just pausing for a moment. Um, just been quite undone by it, so I'll just try and compose myself. Oh, it's good stuff, really is. Oh, oh it's first one, goodness sake. <laughs> Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might, make, he might give eternal life to all those you've given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth, by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They know with certainty that I came from you, and they believe that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you've given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that Scripture would be fulfilled. I'm coming to you now. But I say these things while I'm still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, and they may, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you've given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me, because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you've sent me. I've made you known to them, and will continue to make you known, in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and that I myself may be in them. I wonder if you've ever felt, excuse me, just another moment. <laughs> 
I wonder if you've ever felt uh, daunted by someone else's prayer life. I should say encouraged, shouldn't I? Um, by an example or, or by a testimony of prayer, you know, if, if we had someone come to the microphone and say this week, uh, I was praying this week, uh, and they drop in how long for, or that, you know, there's some kind of detail about the essence of their prayer, and you kind of think, oh, and it was answered, it, isn't that glorious, it was answered, and you kind of think, hallelujah, and inside you also just kind of go, oh no. Because sometimes just in our human flesh, we kind of feel a bit under pressure. Um, and, and, and testimonies or examples can have that quirky quality sometimes. Please do share your testimonies, or we'll all get over ourselves. Um, <laughs> they can have that quirky quality. I can remember times, um, some years ago now, where, where, where lots of leaders of, uh, well, not just leaders, but folk from New Frontiers churches uh, would gather in Peterborough, borrow a church building, and pray and fast. And that, those were great occasions. You'd kind of gather... Uh, uh, more comfortable auditorium than this, to be honest, um, and uh, with hundreds of people, and we'd be asked to pray for something, and a few people would lead us in prayer for that, and then they'd say, you know, turn into small groups, spend a couple of minutes praying for this thing that we're praying about. And it's like, after just a, a minute or two, it's just that great reminder that sometimes prayer is hard work. That's what I took it to mean. Prayer is sometimes hard work. And my prayer might go something like, Dear God, that event that has just been mentioned, I pray that it goes well. In Jesus' name. Amen. I think I'm done there. <laughs> I mean, I, and then kind of up steps Terry, uh, Terry Virgo. And then you just knew, like, for the next 15 minutes, you were just going to be going, Yeah, that's, that's what I meant, Lord. <laughs> I'm praying that as well, Lord. Absolutely. Amen, Terry. I'm totally with you. Uh, and he would just, he just like pray in such a way that just genuinely, just like faith just gets stirred in the room and you're, the whole me meeting is kind of lifted and you just go, yes, yes and amen. We're in it. We're in it, Lord. Or we're, we're kind of getting faith. We're seeing the vision. This isn't just an event. This is God's at work. Just through listening to someone else's prayer, my my dad recommend my, my dad recommended I read this book earlier this year. Maybe it was last year. Um, uh, about a guy called Reese Howells. I don't know if you've come across uh, Reese Howells. Just like if you want to be encouraged, I mean daunted. I mean encouraged by someone's prayer life. <laughs> you just read about this guy. Like in in his earlier years, uh, his life. You know, a hard graft day job in a coal mine walk to work, get back, spend the evening in the Word of God and just praying. And that was it. And he'd get up the next day, he'd go to work, he'd come back and he'd arrive and he'd just pray. And he'd just... There's chapter after chapter of just praying someone into the kingdom. Not just like my five minutes, five second prayer, but just praying, praying people into the kingdom of God. Or, or, or praying for, for healing in, in a way that was just so dogged and so incredible. And then later on, he's praying during the Second World War. And I, I'm not going to be surprised if I get to glory, if I get to the new heavens and the new earth, and I have a, a bit of time with the Lord, and I, and I say, Lord, like, why, why, were we, why was this nation not completely overcome in the Battle of Britain? And I would well expect God to say to me, Reese Howes had a prayer meeting. Did you hear about that? <laughs> He, he, he prayed, you know, affected kind of nations, if you like, through just amazing prayer. So like, it's wonderful to be encouraged by, by examples of prayer. Sometimes we get a little bit um, under pressure. Perhaps you're even feeling that right now. I, I might, you might think to myself, how long did it take me to read the passage? Was that like five minutes? So I've only really got 25 left. You know, and I might think to myself, when, when was the last time I prayed for five minutes in fully coherent sentences? I'm not sure. It's like they all get a little bit jumbled up and a bit broken up. And I know sometimes we feel under pressure. 
And sometimes when that happens, our prayers can be a bit of a token, like, let today go well. What does that even mean? I'm not sure. Amen. Let's just move on. I'm sure the Lord does answer it. Sometimes our prayers can get tremendously uh, horizontal, uh, kind of reflecting on, on family life and realizing sometimes the, the horizontal quality of prayer. Now, I, I think, let me explain what I mean. I think there is an extent to which sometimes when we pray out loud and other people can hear us, we are communicating to them as well as we're communicating to God. Um, I think you know, Jesus, we, we just get glimpses of Jesus' prayer life before this chapter. This is John's style. You get a, just a few little glimpses of Jesus praying and then this massive epic chapter. One of those moments is just Jesus and he's been given the loaves and the fishes and he's surrounded by thousands and thousands of people and it just says in chapter 6 somewhere, Jesus gave thanks. <laughs> just gave thanks. Thank you for these <laughs> these meager resources, Lord, Heavenly Father. Now bless them because we've got 5,000, 6,000, maybe 15,000 people to feed. He just gave thanks. And at, and at Lazarus' tomb, you know, the, the, the tomb is opened and Jesus says, Father, thank you. Thank you that you heard me. I, I know that you heard me. I know that you hear me. I said this for their benefit. That's an example of horizontal prayer. He's, he's praying for other people's benefit. It's no bad thing to do. To pray in such a way that other people will be strengthened and encouraged. But sometimes we can, if we get disappointed, if we get a bit under pressure, we actually kind of forget that we're speaking with God. It just becomes this kind of horizontal moment. I might have mentioned before that, that my granddad would, would begin a meal with the formulaic, rather formulaic words, for what we're about to receive. I've told you this before. For what we're about to receive, may the Lord make us truly grateful. And I, my granddad was a praying man. I, I might be here because he prayed. At that moment, I also just wonder if what he is doing is saying, don't say anything bad about your grandma's cooking. Okay, there was, an, there was a kind of horizontal quality to it. That, that's the kind of thing that is going on in a, when a community prays. But sometimes we so dial down our expectations, that's what we're kind of thinking. I, I didn't manage to squeeze my advice into the conversation earlier on in small group, so I'll just pray it instead. Uh, maybe that's okay. Um, but we can kind of forget that we're speaking to the God of glory. Um, if you're feeling daunted by prayer... Or maybe if you're feeling jaded, a bit discouraged. Or maybe if you're feeling bored. Then this passage here is given by God to restore to us the wonder of prayer. Like, we, like I said, we, we glimpse it elsewhere in John's Gospel. If, if we were reading through Luke's Gospel, it's almost like every page he's saying, Jesus prayed, Jesus prayed, Jesus prayed. Here, it's all kind of uh, stored up, if you like, for this wonderful, glorious chapter. We are considering today, and the reason why it's moving to read it out, is I think I can confidently say, this is the greatest prayer ever prayed by the greatest prayer. So allow that just to take the pressure off. Like the award, as far as I think we should be concerned, the award has already been given out. It's already been given to Jesus. His glorious prayer life is what we are admiring today. This is going to feed us. And what we're to do is to marvel. Like with all of John's Gospel, we're just to marvel at who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And as a footnote, we'll draw out a few things to ponder to help us in praying. But first of all, let's just marvel. I'm kind of pretending that my message only has two points. But like people write books, uh, people preach for like maybe a couple of years and still find somewhere to go on a chapter like this. So uh, I'm pretending that I've just got two points. I'm going to race through a little bit. I'm hoping you won't notice that it's actually more like 25. But anyway, let's just start with point number one. We're supposed to marvel 
at Jesus. Who he is and what he's done. And we're going to see aspects of his prayer that are just utterly unique. I could, I could start, we could even call this the Lord's Prayer. And you know, we might think, oh, but it doesn't say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Well, we, that's the disciples' prayer. That's the disciples saying, teach us how to pray. Pray like this. This is the Lord praying. And as he begins, well, let me just begin. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. Jesus is praying that he himself would be glorified. Now, he's praying that because he also wants the Father to be glorified. Let's just take a step back for a moment and think, I don't think that's for me to pray. Glorify me. That's, that's not what we're doing, is it? But for Jesus, the God incarnate, we're listening in to God the Son have a conversation, a prayerful conversation with his heavenly Father. And I think we're just supposed to say, wow. The God is, God, Jesus is wanting to be glorified. And it's totally right that Jesus be glorified. And his glory is kind of beyond our understanding. You can say in verse 5, and now Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. This prayer stretches all the way back to before the universe was created. And, and the Son of God said, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Utter, radiant, beautiful, pure, powerful, awesome, shining glory. That's the glory I want, said Jesus. Restore that to me now. But he could also pray, or he could also uh, share in, in John chapter 12, uh, and uh, just reading from verse 23, and Jesus there says some similar words, albeit not quite in the same way. Jesus replied, the hour has come. For the Son of Man to be glorified. What did he mean by that? Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. While anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honour the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it. And I will glorify it again. For Jesus to be glorified means having the glory that he had before the universe was created. And also means going through with the plan to die on the cross. Glorify your son would be that shape. That's how he was glorified, to be lifted up. And it's the Father's desire. It's his desire that the Father is glorified. It's, it's his w desire to reveal the Father to others so that Philip could ask the question, you know, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus says, have I, not, have I not been with you long enough? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And you can think all the way through John's gospel and think, well, how has he revealed that glory? In amazing ways, as we've seen. Because what this shows us is something about God's glory. Let's marvel at that. All the way through uh, the prayer as well, we're, we're seeing the wonderful, not just glory, but we're seeing generosity. We're seeing the generosity of God the Father, the generosity of uh, the Son, that's revealed in Jesus. How has he revealed God's glory? It says that he has completed the work that the Father gave him to do. The Father has given Jesus all authority, we're told in verse 2. The Father has given people to Jesus. That's partly what it means for, for Jesus to be glorified, was the Father to give him followers, to give him people. 
And Jesus has been given work. And then he's revealing the generosity of God. He's showing what it's like when, when heaven touches earth, when God comes amongst us, when God is at work, we see water turn into wine. We see the blind healed. We see the dead raised. We see the lame walk. We see five loaves and two fish multiply and multiply and just keep feeding crazy, crazy resources that come from almost nothing as, the, as Jesus gives thanks. We see this, the ridiculous, over-the-top, lavish uh, generosity of God. That God is glorified by giving people to Jesus. Uh, and, and God is glorified as Jesus gives eternal life to all those uh, whom God had given to him. And we find out in verse 3, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent Eternal life or, or, or life that belongs to the age to come is knowing God. So eternal life is only really going to appeal to people who, who are attracted to wanting to know God. You could live forever. Well, it's a nightmare unless you know God. But if you know God you'll know more and more about his glory to be seen and be revealed. So we're seeing something of the glory of God. We're seeing something of the, the generosity of the Father and the Son. We're seeing the amazing compassion of Jesus, like we haven't seen this already, but just bear with me. You know, if you're looking through your Bible um, at the text in front of you, um, and admittedly the headings aren't inspired, but they, they can be a little helpful guide, you might see headings that say, Jesus prays to be glorified. Five verses. Jesus prays for his disciples. Massive section. What's Jesus doing? Consider the occasion. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And what does Jesus do? He spends a lot of time praying for his disciples. He's been talking to them for chapters and chapters to encourage them, to prepare them for the fact that he's going to be taken away from them, but that he's going to send the Holy Spirit. He wants them to know, you're, you're going to have trouble, but I have overcome. And so just see the tremendous compassion of a saviour praying for his disciples, for their protection he's been with them and he's been protecting them with the word of God Judas has fallen he had friendship offered to him but he chose to become the traitor doomed to destruction but Jesus is praying for his disciples you get you get another glimpse uh, towards the end of Luke's gospel where where Jesus tells Luke you know, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. You're going to be tested. It's going to be painful, Peter. This is not going to be easy. You're going to be pressed through. You're going to be put through the mill. You're, Jesus knew that he'd fail. But I've prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And when you come back, strengthen your brothers. Jesus knows that disciples of, of Jesus are going to get tested. But he's prayed. He's prayed that his disciples would be protected. No one taken out of God's hands. No one snatched away. Tested but protected. And to think of that care, his kindness, his compassion, and consider the focus of that time as well. You know, I mentioned, you know, there's, on that other occasion, there's a crowd of however many thousand, and they're all starving hungry. Massive, massive need. 
And what does Jesus do? Five loaves, two fish. And he gives thanks. Breaks it up. He starts giving it out. And what do we see here in this prayer? Oh, a, a whole world of need. A whole world of problems. What's Jesus doing? Praying for 11 disciples. Praying for his small group. Praying with tremendous focus. I'm sure he was including Mary and Martha and, and Lazarus in there as well. But the saviour of the world at this point is praying for 11 people. I'm going. I'm praying for them. To have, I mean, that's, that's faith in the power of God. In a really vulnerable moment, really, really small beginnings. That's faith in God who can do immeasurably more than we can ever ask or imagine. To focus in on these 11 randoms. And, and bear in mind how much during this prayer, you can check this later, how much during this prayer Jesus mentions the world. Loads. And you read in verse 9, I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world. I mean, there are things about this that should surprise us. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. Totally Focus. Sometimes we can just get overcome by the problems in the world. And then just get dizzy with all the things we feel we ought to be praying about. But Jesus was totally focused on this tiny fledgling community that would become a church of 120 people. And even then would look tiny. It's okay to focus. I, I kind of wonder sometimes with, if prayer triplets might help us. Because then you kind of just, you're just praying in a focused way for the rubbish, difficult troubles and challenges that two other people are going through. <laughs> Maybe that would help us. Anyway, so I see Jesus' focused prayer. It's good to focus on the church. It's good to focus on God's people. It's good to say, look at, the, look at the world out there, but God, you're doing something special right here. There's something special right here about belonging to you, about receiving your word, about believing you, about how I'm you know, thankful to God. Jesus is thankful to his heavenly father. These, heaven, these 11 guys have not been snatched away and I'm going to pray they're protected. I'm going to send them into the world. To pray, to pray for the church in, in those terms. I can see our marvel here at uh, confidence as well. Jesus does care about the world. He loves the world. And he wants people to receive eternal life. Because that will give glory to the Father. And so he prays in verse 20. This is where we come in. My prayer is not for them alone. I'm not just praying for these 11 guys. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Just stop there. Is that not utterly remarkable? My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. He totally knows people are going to respond in faith to the gospel, to the good news. He totally knows the power of the good news that's only in Jesus to transform lives. It's not this kind of desperate, oh God, if only one person would get saved, then we believe you're good. Totally knows people are going to get saved. People are going to respond to the good news. I'm praying for those who will believe. That, that's confident prayer. I mean, this does challenge us no end. There's this, this powerful good news that is going to like, just ripple through the entire planet, through all years of history. And here we are. <laughs> is that not awesome? Should we not be marveling at Jesus' effective, fruitful prayer life? 
I'm praying for the 11 people. And now, Lord, Heavenly Father, I'm just praying for billions, really. I'm praying for the millions that are going to come to faith throughout every continent, speaking all sorts of different languages. They're going to know that I am the Son of God and that I died for sin to bring us into relationship. I'm jumbling up my tenses, forgive me. That is pretty awesome. So here's a few things to ponder as we marvel at Jesus' prayer life. To be encouraged. You know, there, there are, like I said, aspects of this prayer that, that will not come from our lips. But when we pray, we pray in the light of it. And this reminds us John's Gospel reminds us that a fruitful prayer life is the privilege of every child of God. Go right back to the beginning. Go right back to uh, the prologue in, in John chapter 1. Verse, um, verse 11. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet... To all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born of natural descent, or not born of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Now, what would you think of, you know, let's just imagine, we've got a big family join the church. Oh, this is going to get strange. Forgive me. Um, let's imagine this, imagine a family, and they've got 12, 12 kids, variety of ages, different temperaments and talents and all the rest of it. And you find out that only one of those children is, to al is allowed to approach dad and ask for anything. I mean, that should like set off some alarm bells, wouldn't it, really, I think. Um, Twelve kids, but only one of them can, can go direct to dad and ask for something. I mean, that's, that's going to be a busy sibling. Because everyone's going to say, please say this to dad. Please say that to dad. Please, could you ask this? For, for every practicality, for every emotional need or whatever, it, it just goes through one sibling. It's all very efficient. It's worked out. Big, big pyramid structure in the family. And maybe one you know, youngest sibling just asks the next one, will, will you mention to our eldest brother, you know, just some crazy chain, you, you mention... To, to the oldest brother, and, and that brother can mention to dad, and then, and then the answer can come like back down the chain. That would just be weird, and, and more than weird. But I wonder if that's how we kind of think prayer is sometimes. But here, we, Jesus says in chapter 16, and verse 26 to 27, in that day you will ask in my name. I'm not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. So he says, I'm not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. The glory of the gospel in Jesus is that we are kind of, we're included in Jesus so that we can pray direct to the Father. So we say, yeah, Jesus is like, he's like my older brother. But he's opened up the way. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah, come through me, but you speak to your heavenly Father. If we think of prayer as a skill or a talent, Probably only, we'll probably think that only a few people have that skill or talent. And your job is to go and find someone. Go and find someone who is good at praying. And ask them to pray for your situation. And I wonder sometimes if that's what we do. Kind of just like fire out prayer requests. Because behind it all, we're just not convinced that God hears us when we pray. Now, I think we can turn to a few places in Scripture and we'll find Scripture that helps us to see, yeah, ask someone to pray for you. Paul says 
in Colossians and elsewhere as well, please pray for me. That's a perfectly legitimate thing to do. I'm going to do it right now. Please pray for those, please pray for me. Please pray for those who preach. Please pray that we would be courageous. Please pray in the light of the fact that we, now, we have that camera over there. This is, I don't know for how long we'll live broadcast. Newsflash. But um, no doubt we'll, we'll keep using that. We'll record it and we'll, we'll put ourselves on YouTube. Does that, I wonder to myself, stop us from preaching more courageously sometimes? I don't know what you'd think, but I know out there somewhere, I might score some points for preaching about the environment. Maybe I should preach about the environment sometimes. Maybe that's something we should consider. But you take your life in your own hands, metaphorically speaking, if I was to preach about the, the rights of the unborn. Because out there, that might get a reaction. And I, I want to pray for a church to be utterly united and one, passionate for Jesus, thoroughly convinced of the apostles' message. But sometimes what we do is we just downgrade that kind of unity into something that we can kind of construct ourselves and just find the lowest common denominator. I don't want us to waste our time or God's glory by just aiming for like the lowest common denominator. Maybe we should upset a few more people sometimes when we preach. Maybe kind of God's glory coming would look like a church getting a little bit smaller because we're not messing about. I'm not trying, I don't want to kind of cause offence for the sake of it. But if there's never a reaction, what are we doing? Yeah? Yeah? Watch this space. Um, but I know you do pray. I know you do pray. And I'll pray for you. We'll pray. You know what we heard about someone giving out Bibles in their changing room. Does that just like fire up to pray? I can get behind that in prayer. Just go for it. I don't know what, I don't know what heat you take. I imagine what heat I might take is possibly hypothetical, but what, what heat do you take? I want you to be courageous. I want you to be kind of thoroughly alive with the apostolic gospel. Yes, love the planet, but Jesus isn't, he's not praying for the world. He wants to see people rescued out of the world. We're not just trying to pray that the world would be a little bit improved. We're not just trying to pray that every politician in the UK might be nicer. We're praying in the light of people going to hell if they don't know Jesus. We're praying in the light of eternal destiny. And it matters. It matters that we pray like it matters. Let's believe for a fruitful prayer life. That is a massive aside. You can say to someone else, please pray for me. But don't just say it because you don't believe you, your prayers are heard. You get before your heavenly father. You close the door. You don't need to go through all the siblings. You speak to your heavenly father. And in the name of Jesus, he's going to hear you. He's going to reward you. You can pray. We're not aiming to be some weird dysfunctional family. How would your prayer life change as of today if you were totally convinced that Jesus, that the heavenly father listens to you? And if, Jesus, if the heavenly father hears your prayer, he answers it. I wonder if that gives you a bit of a but I've been a bit bold there. Uh, there are mysteries. There are mysteries in prayer, left, right and centre. But I wonder if we overplay the mystery card sometimes.
Prayer doesn't get answered. Oh God, you're mysterious. His thoughts are above our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. But what if there's another reason why your prayers aren't being answered? What if we find out from the Bible why sometimes prayer isn't answered? We could go to 1 Peter chapter 3, and I could have a chat with husbands, and say, if you read 1 Peter 3 verse 7, that will give you a reason sometimes why your prayers might not be answered. Husbands, live in a considerate way with your wives. And if you don't, your prayers get hindered. You could be praying the most powerful stuff, glorifying to Jesus and honoring God. But if you're not honoring your wife, then God is going to make sure your prayers are hindered. That's not a mystery. That could be kind of like revelation. If you're shouting at your wife, why should God listen to your prayers? If you're inconsiderate, if you're harsh, if you're overbearing, if you're selfish, if you prefer your own needs, if you're kind of trapped in a pattern of thought where if you kind of think, well, if everyone else would just be better at respecting me, then life would just be so much easier. But that verse is to you. It's not to your wife. Maybe your wife can disrespect you and your prayers still get answered. Her prayers are still answered. I'm not saying I'm totally certain here. But God doesn't speak the precise same words to husbands and the precise same words to wives. Maybe that's it. Maybe you could read on to 1 Peter chapter 5 and see that God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. So if God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble, then your prayers can be resisted if you are proud, whoever you are, whatever gender. If you are always right, if you always think you're right, then the Lord might try and thwart your prayers for a while to teach you to humble yourself. What's your, what's your attitude like towards those in authority? Because if you're always kind of like antagonized by people in authority and always aware of how much better job they should be doing, when you speak to the one who's in ultimate authority over all things, I don't know how to finish that sentence. <laughs> there are mysteries involved. James says more positively, James says, the prayers of a righteous man are powerful and effective. You grow in your righteousness before God and I think your prayer life is going to get more and more fruitful. Let's all glory in this wonderful position that we have. We can come right into our Father's presence and bring our requests to God. We will worship in a bit, don't worry. Um, but you, you grow in your righteousness. You, you deal ruthlessly with sin. Cut off compromise. Enjoy God's word. And I think your prayers are going to get turbocharged. Let's see that there's no bad time to pray. You can have a fruitful prayer life. Let's see from this chapter that God answers prayer. Jesus prayed that he would be glorified. Has Jesus been glorified? I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure he has the glory on the throne of heaven, the lamb that was slain. I'm pretty sure that's a position of ultimate glory and that our eyes will see. Were the disciples protected? Yeah. They didn't have an easy life. Most of them were martyrs. But they didn't fall away. They did what God wanted them to do. They were sanctified. The Spirit revealed truth to them. We have the word of God. They ran their race. God answers prayer. Is the church united? Ah. Well, let's remember. Jesus 
prayers are answered or they're in the process of being answered. The unity of the church is not just something that we achieve and manufacture. It is the work of the Holy Spirit and our job is to maintain it. So it's right to honour each other in a church. It's right to kind of uh, honour other churches, not kind of seek to uh, explode differences and so on. But let's just bear in mind, Jesus, I think his prayers get answered as a work of the Spirit. Can't elaborate on that right now. And prayer, it belongs to mission. What would our prayers reveal about the mission that we are on? There are challenges in life, uh, and I don't despise praying for, for health, praying about challenges, play, praying through trouble. Um, just really in this year, uh, well, this month, in, in my family, in, 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 the, in the Mason clan, uh, there will be at least uh, three, possibly four operations under general anaesthetic. As a family, we've been praying through uh, cancer, holes in the heart, uh, broken necks, uh, house fires, long COVID. God is answering a lot of prayers, and there might be some mysteries within that. It's just weird, isn't it? And we can look for, we can look for explanations and go searching, God, why is all this stuff happening? And maybe the simplest one is, the end of chapter 16, in this life, you will have trouble. All you've got to do is live long enough, and it will find you. And sometimes maybe there are like very specific things to find and, and, and try and solve and, and, and so on. What's going on, God? What's going on? But it's just it's trouble. And that's going to happen. And so let's pray for, for health. Let's pray for healing. Let's pray for circumstances. But what's the mission that we're on? If that's all I prayed about, it could almost be my mission is for Christians to live a comfortable life. I just, I just, my prayer life is I want Christians to be healthy. I do. And I'll tell you why. Because there's a mission that we, didn't, we shouldn't be distracted from. Let's pray for healthy Christians so that more people hear the good news about Jesus. So that people come to faith. So that the kingdom grows. So that the church is this vibrant kind of city on a hill that cannot be hidden and people are drawn to it and they just go, wow, there's something about you. It's because we're healthy, isn't it? <laughs> no, it's because there's a whole heap of trouble that you're encountering as well. But I can see there's something I can't account for. That is eternal life. Life of the age to come, empowered by the Spirit, amongst the people who look totally ordinary, but amongst whom dramatically extraordinary things happen. And they seem to have this measure of joy. Not the absence of trouble, but they have the fullness of joy. That's why we should pray. Amen. Let's quickly worship.